بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Brothers and sisters in Islam today and this day and age that we live in there are many fitan around us, trials and tribulations. There's lots of injustice and corruption and oppression that is taking place all around us. And if a believer is not close to the Quran, he will definitely become lost. And many doubts will creep in his mind and he will find himself in terms of his faith somewhere where he shouldn't be. And so one of the main matters one of the main matters that protect a person's Iman, protect his faith from faith-based doubts, misconceptions about Allah, doubts about Allah and His mercy in the afterlife and so on. And one main thing that protects a person from fitan al-shubu al-shahawat, desires and temptations and sins that are all around us, is no doubt having a solid relationship with the Qur'an, and more specifically, the stories that are mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, in the Qur'an, the purpose of why He reveals stories and narrates them unto the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَكُلَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, these are the stories of the prophets and messengers. We reveal them to you for what purpose? Why? Why do I have to know about Nuh alayhi salam? Why do I have to know about Ibrahim alayhi salam? These are prophets that existed hundreds of years ago. We will not be questioned about what they did. They don't know what we do. So why do we have to know about them? The only reason Allah Azza wa Jal says, لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فؤادك, So that your re heart remains firm and steadfast upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon la ilaha illallah. And concerning the rest of the stories that are in the Qur'an, other than the stories of the prophets, like a story that is with us tonight, Allah Azza wa Jal says about them, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ In the stories of the prophets and the messengers and the stories of the Qur'an, indeed there is valuable lessons for people of intellect. أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ The people of intellect are the believers. A believer is a person of intellect. He uses his mind in every circumstance and situation. Indeed, in the stories, there are valuable lessons. Valuable lessons for people of intellect. Ibrah. You know what a Ibrah is? In the Arabic language, the word Ibrah, which we translated as valuable lessons and wisdoms, Ibrah comes from the word Abara. And Abara means to cross the river one from one side to the other. That's what abara is. Like a abira is like a little boat that people get on and it takes them from one side to another side. The idea is that the stories of the Quran take you from misguidance to guidance. They take you from doubt to certainty. They take you from kufr to iman. They take you from life of rebellion and sin to a life of righteousness and uprightness. This is what abira is. Every story in the Qur'an you should find somewhere in your life has become better. Whether it's you thinking of Allah and your thoughts of Allah Azza wa Jal and His mercy and His forgiveness and Him being a witness to all matters that happen on earth. After a story in the Qur'an, your attitude and your perspective about Allah should change to the better. Your relationship with Allah should change to the better. In the end of that ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ That the stories that are in the Qur'an are also hudan, guidance. And this is what we're in need of. We say, اِهْدِنَ الصَّلَاةَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ 17 times a day in our salat. It should teach you and I that the main thing we're supposed to ask Allah every single day is guidance. Where do I get this guidance from? Is it like something abstract? Like I just need to ask for guidance and oh, we'll look for it. it. might drop from the sky somewhere. Let hear the Quran. Allah told you. The stories are guidance. So when you say, إِهْدِنَ الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And then the Imam recites a story. 
that's in the Quran, or you listen to a story of the Quran being narrated onto you, then you need to, as Ulil Albab, people of intellect, switch it on and say that this story, I shouldn't just listen and be entertained by its events. I should be sourcing and extracting its guidance and seeing how I can develop and better my relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. No doubt, there is not a book on earth that has this effect. The only book on earth that can have a deep effect on your heart and on your mind and on your thinking and on your decisions is the Quran. No other book on earth. And that in and of itself is a miracle of the Quran. And the stories also are a mercy for the believers. And you'll see how as we begin to explain what we have with us. So because we are living fitan and tests and calamities all around us, we cannot afford to distance away from the Quran. So this story that is found in the Quran will no doubt enhance our relationship and our thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will bring us a step closer to Allah azza wa jal. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we've titled tonight's talk, Youth in Action, The Boy Who Changed the World. And this story, the vast majority of it was narrated by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith that is found in Sahih Muslim. And part of the story, which is the end, was mentioned by Allah azza wa jal in the Quran in Surah Al-Buruj. And it is incredible and it's amazing to ponder over this fact. And that is that this is a story of a young boy and a king and a magician and a minister involved as well. This young boy, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions him in the Quran. <coughs> yeah, and that means that this boy is a source of guidance and inspiration, not only for you and I, but for the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and for the companions. Can you imagine? Allah azza wa jal narrating this story of a young boy. What did this young boy do? How did he reach such a status and a level with Allah that among millions and millions of events that happen on earth, Allah will choose this boy's story to make mention, permanent mention of it in the Quran and we're supposed to memorize it and have this story in our hearts. And the first one who benefits from this young boy is the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all the companions. And then you and I that come. Huge. This is such a huge and a powerful concept to contemplate and ponder over. This is not some boy. This is a boy mentioned by Allah and then mentioned by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to all of us. So we memorize his life, we stop at each and every single word, and we analyze what is happening. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the story of this young boy and the king and the magician takes place after Isa alayhi salam and before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Between Isa and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is about 600 years. This story takes place somewhere between that time. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam begins to narrate the story and he says, كَانَ مَلِكٌ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ He gathered the companions. Bismillah, just like we gathered today, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept the gathering. And he says to them, much before you, there was a king. There was a king. And this king, he ruled his town and he ruled his people. وَكَانَ لَهُ سَاحِرٌ and he had by his right hand a magician. He had with him a magician. And every king at the time had a magician with him. What's the point of the magician? You see, the king wants to say to the people that I'm your, your Lord, worship me. But it's very difficult to convince the people that you're the Lord. So how do you make it easier upon the people? He would bring a magician. The magician will put on a show some magic, some, something fascinating the eyes have never seen. And then the king would say, see, I told you I'm your Lord. And then people say, fine, okay, we accept that you're God. Just like what Fir'aun did. Fir'aun had magicians, magicians put on a show and the people accept that Fir'aun is 
رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى He's the highest and he's the high lord of ours. He's Al-A'la. So this is what the king would do. كَانَ لَهُ سَاحِرٌ And you see, we want to make a reflection here. This is not just the story of the past. Up until this day, this same concept is repeated, even in our times. So you know these Western governments that exist around the world? They are acting and playing the role of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how they claim it to be, right? They want to create godless societies. They take it upon themselves to legislate matters that are only a right of Allah azza wa to legislate. So they will come and they will say that same-sex marriage is permissible, it's lawful, abortion laws come in. Ah, whenever they want to decide to bring something to mankind, they just make it up. Overnight, in a cabinet meeting of theirs, and the next day, they produce and they make a law for the people. And yes, we are God, follow us. This is what we've told you to do. That's your liberty, that's your freedom, and follow it. And how do they deceive and how do they trick the people? Well, they have no magician to their side. What do they have? They have the media, and the media is just like a magician. The media is out there to deceive and change the perspective of people. That's what media does, and they're really good at it. So the media is the magician of these governments. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned and taught us that one of the types of magic is magic of speech. He said, Inna min al-bayani la sihra. Some of speech appears to be magic. A foolish person could have such eloquence and such a deceptive way of speaking that if he speaks a few words, he can cast lots of doubt into you and make you turn towards his side. And this is exactly how it happens. So this story that's being narrated is very similar, in fact, the same as the times that we live in today. And this concept, how does it work in Islam? In Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal sends a prophet. He sends a prophet. The prophet never claims to be God. Rather, the prophet says, I am a messenger sent by God to you people. And I have a book for you. I have laws and legislations that you're supposed to follow. It's very difficult. The people will not believe a prophet. Who are you? Why did Allah appoint you as opposed to all of us? So what does Allah Azza wa do? Allah Azza wa will aid this prophet with a miracle, with a mu'jiza. So when the miracle is done by this prophet, his claim of being a prophet becomes a lot more believable. So people will say to Salih, uh, see that stone there? Make it into a she-camel. She-camel, a pregnant camel in its 10th month. What a crazy thing to demand. Yet that's what they wanted. So they looked at the boulder, and there you have it. A she-camel, huge. Tenth month, it's pregnant. It begins to walk. Allahu Akbar, what a miracle. And you see that in your eyes. You're supposed to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And you, O Salih, are the messenger of Allah. So Allah Azza wa Jal will aid the prophets with miracles. These devils will do it in another way. They'll have a magician to put on some deceptive magic to the people and they convince the people that we are your lords. So then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَلَمَّا كَبُرْ This magician now reached old age. قَالَ malik. He came to the king and he said to him, O oh king, إِنِّي قَدْ كَبِرْتَ I've become old. I'm about to die. I've become weak. I can't do this work that I always do for you. فَبَعَثْ إِلَيَّ غُلَامًا أُعَلِّمُهُ السِّحْرِ Send me a gulam. Send me a young boy. Ulam is about the age of 12, 13, 14. That's what the Ulam's age is. Send me a Ulam and I want to teach him magic. I'll spend the rest of my life teaching him my experience and my skills and my knowledge. And he'll be the next right hand man of you. I'll tell you something, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Just observe this. See, the people of falsehood, the people of disbelief, they work day and night to keep their falsehood alive and ongoing in the community. They never give up. This guy, he's dying. He's a magician. Khalas just die and go. What do you want? What do you want? 
about what happens on earth and the affairs on earth. May you're dead you're in your grief. You've got no more concern. But they have a great concern to keep falsehood active and alive and keep the people deceived on earth. Look at his effort. If this is the effort of the people of falsehood, how much more stronger and intense should the efforts of the believers be in raising the young generation, the future Muslims? Should be a lot more. And these disbelievers, they actually have sabr. They have sabr over their falsehood. I use the word sabr because Allah used it in the Quran when He described their efforts. Allah Azza wa Jalla said about the disbelievers that they said to one another, "Animshu wasbiru ala alihatikum." They would say to each other, "Let's walk. Let's march the streets and walk among the society and the community. Wasbiru ala alihatikum, and be patient upon your idols." Stick to the worship of the idols. Uphold the worship of the idols. Isbiru, be patient, no problems. The disbelievers, they have this. When it comes to their deen and their agenda and whatever they want to poison the people with, they are patient non-stop. They spend thousands and millions and millions to continue their propaganda and the evil destruction of people in their mind and their fitrah. Where is the people of Islam? Where are the believers? Our effort should be 10, 20, 100 times more than what they put. And especially in the young children. The young children that come to the masjid. Those that sometimes we become irritated from them because of their noise in the back. But whether you like it or not, this is the future Muslims. These are the people that will carry Al Islam after you and I. So there needs to be extra care and great care. If the disbelievers could see that then we should see that a lot more and a lot clearer. So he said to him, send me a boy so I can teach him. Why does he want a young boy? Why didn't the king, why didn't this magician say, send me someone, like someone 30, 40 years old, someone more experienced than alert, send me a young boy. Because the young boy, the younger age is actually the age of knowledge and learning. The one who learns at a young age, firstly, he's quicker to learn. Secondly, knowledge that he learns when he's young is retained in his mind. As opposed to someone that's older, 30, 40, 50, what he learns, he might forget the next day or the next week. But what you learn when you are young, 10, 11, 12, retains and it remains strong in the mind. And a, word, a, a child can always recall it. Right? That's the idea, that's why he wants someone young. And that's why we need to learn and understand that the age of the youth is an age of seeking knowledge and learning. One big problem we have in society today is we look at these young boys and we say, oh, don't go to hard. Leave him on his Xbox. Leave him on his games. Let him play. This is an age of play and entertainment. Let him be. Let him live his life. What do you mean let him live his life? That age of 13, 14, 15, this is the age of learning. Oh, well, when do you think the age of learning is? When? If it's not in the younger years, when is that? This is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had great concern for the youth. He will take them with, he take, literally will take them with him. He's on a camel, he brings Ibn Abbas, he puts him behind him. He takes Usama, radiallahu anhu, puts him behind him, these are young kids. They're always with him, he's always teaching them. He comes to Mu'adh, he says to Mu'adh, I love you for the sake of Allah. Don't forget, after every salah say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrik wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Alright, ya Allah. He'd come, he'd hold them, he'd touch their hands, he'd embrace them, he'd hug them. He would give salam to the young boys, he would pass by them, he would say to them, Assalamu alaikum. He would bring them certain things. There was a young man, his name was Umair, radiallahu anhu. His bird, his pet bird died. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to him to give him condolences. He considered, he considered his emotional situation a bird. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there. Wherever the youth were, he was always there. 
and he would upgrade their skills. He would give them secrets and he would test to see would they keep this secret or would they let it go? How can Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with the youth? Once he gave Mu'adh ibn Jabal a secret. When Mu'adh ibn Jabal was a young boy, he wasn't even the age of 10. And he would walk and he would pass by his mother. And he would say to his mother, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entrusted me with some knowledge I need to send to someone. She would say to him, what is it? She would say, mother, I can't tell you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is testing him. What we learn from this is that children at the age of nine should learn what al-amana is. If I entrust him with something, by the, by the age of nine, he should know how to keep a secret. Are you testing your own children on this or not? See the concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This was his concern with the youth. And so this is why this magician wants a young boy. فَبَعَثَ إِلَيْهِ غُلَامًا يُعَلِّمُهُ so obviously the magician requested from the king. The king is the king, he's in contact with the whole community. He knows where the smart ones are, the intelligence are, the not so bright ones, he knows them all. So he knows where the bright family is, the intelligent family is, he approaches them, bring me your son. Congratulations, he's gonna have a position in the king, in the palace of the king. What a, this is a life-changing opportunity for this family. I want you to imagine and think of this, and the start of this young boy, and what kind of life and worldly life was offered to him. You have just been approached by the king. And he has come to your family and says, we see potential in your young boy. He's going to be on the payroll of the king. You people are set for life. You don't have to work another day in your life. You will never face any financial calamity in your life. We've got you covered. Send me your boy. Who wouldn't jump on this opportunity? They jumped on the opportunity and sent the young son go. So this young boy goes and he begins to go to the magician and he starts to learn magic. Allahu Akbar. One of the worst professions in life is to be a magician. The worst people on earth are the magicians. And that's what he's learning. فَكَانَ فِي طَرِيقِهِ إِذَا سَلَكَ رَاهِبٌ فَقَعْدَ إِلَيْهِ وَسَمِعَ كَلَامَهُ فَأَعْجَبَهُ One day, as he's leaving his house on this daily uh, path to the magician, he heard a noise halfway on the road. He heard a noise coming from a cave. He went up to the cave and he found a monk, an old man, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal and reading. Reading what? What was the book that was revealed to Isa alayhi salam? Al-Injil. He was reading the Injil. And he's reading the preserved, pure teachings of Isa alayhi salam. The Injil that had a tawheed in it, calling to the oneness of Allah azza wa jal. Not the distorted and the altered one. So this monk was a believer in Isa alayhi salam and in la ilaha illallah. What's this monk doing in the cave? Because you need to understand something, I'll explain it very quickly. After Isa alayhi salam, for about 300 years, Al-Injil was as it is. It hasn't been altered, still a tawheed in there, people were upon the pure teachings of Isa alayhi salam. When the, uh, when the Christians finally met the Romans, and this was about in the year 325, when the Christians met the Romans, the Romans rejected them and their belief. They said, you people worship one Lord. And asked the Romans, we worship multiple gods. The Romans, they had multiple gods, just like the, the Greeks. They had multiple gods and like the Pharaohs. So the Romans were mushrikeen, polytheists. So the Christians came together and they made an agreement that they are going to introduce the Trinity in their religion, which is now the concept of, you know, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son, and we'll merge them, we'll say these are three different individuals, but they share this one person, which is God. They wanted to merge their religion of Tawheed, having something about God, with the religion of the Romans that was Shirk. 
And this is how the Trinity came about. And its first ever teaching was in 325. And that's when the Bible began to change and the teachings of Isa alayhi salam changed and altered. And anyone after that time that upheld the true teachings of Isa alayhi salam was exiled, was tortured, was punished, was killed. And so this is why the monk is hiding in the cave. He had ran away from society. He's in a cave preserving his deen, doesn't want to mix with anyone. Right? And this is why even the story of Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave that you read in on Friday, they were also in a cave and ran away from their people because they existed at that time as well. So this is why this monk is in the cave. So he heard him. فَأَعْجَبَهُ كَلَامُهُ This young boy was amazed by the words of this monk. You see, the fitrah that hasn't been distorted yet is always amazed by the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahu Akbar. I tell you something, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Wallahi, a fact. Anyone, anyone that had a corrupt, rebellious life and made a tawbah, most likely, actually definitely, it was because of one ayah he heard. It's because of one hadith he heard. Nothing more. That's the power of the Qur'an. That's the power of Allah Azza wa Jal's word. One ayah is enough to change your life. And I actually have a lecture prepared for this. The one ayah that changed the lives of millions. And we go through examples how this guy says that this part of the ayah changed his life. And he became a Muslim because of it. Things that are incredible. So this is why the young boy is saying, A'jabahu. He was amazed. Because all of Allah's speech is amazing. Inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaba. The jinn. When they heard the Qur'an, they said, we heard an amazing word. So now, he goes to the monk. He's learning at Tawheed. He's learning the purpose of life. He's, he's learning Islam. And then he finishes from the monk and he goes to the magician. He learns magic. He goes back to his family. Watch it, polar opposites. He's learning kufr and he's learning iman. The worst type of kufr and the best type of iman. فَكَانَ إِذَا أَتَى السَّاحِرَ مَرَّ بِالرَّاهِبِ وَقَعَدَ عِنْدَهُ And he began to make a habit of this. Every day, before he goes to the magician, passes by the monk, learns about Allah, about the Tawheed, and then he goes to the magician. I tell you something, and I need the young boys to listen very carefully. This monk and the boy teaches us something very important, and that is, as a young boy, you need to have a teacher that teaches you. Do not come out to the world and share knowledge when you have never learnt and appointed a teacher for yourself. This is dangerous and this is how the religion becomes distorted and corrupted. All along why we are thinking you're doing good. Even the Prophet ﷺ had a teacher and that would be Jibreel alayhi salam. Can you imagine? The people once, a man came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to him, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul buldani ahabbu ila Allah, wa ayyul buldani abghadu ila Allah. He said to him, Messenger of Allah, which land is most beloved to Allah, which land is most hated to Allah? You see, if I asked you this question, how many people would rush to answer it? You've already got something, you've made up something in your mind about which is the most beloved and which is the most hated. You know what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded to this man? He said to him, لا أدري. I don't know. حتى أسأل جبريل. Let me ask Jibreel. So he asked Jibreel, what's the most beloved land to Allah? What's the most hated land to Allah? So Jibreel said, I don't know. He went to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal answered the question. He came back to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said to him, that Allah said, the most beloved land to Allah is the Masajid. And the most hated land to Allah is the marketplaces. Not the marketplace itself, but because of what happens in the marketplace of gossip and slander and cheating and swearing and uh, riba and so on. A simple question. Yet the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam has a teacher to go back to and ask, young boys, don't ever... And today, because social media has made it very easy, you just open an account for yourself and say, oh, no, I'm teaching the religion of Allah. You're not. 
If you don't have a teacher and you've learned under a teacher, you're, you're teaching something completely different and false. You must have a teacher. And so this young boy finds this monk and he's learning. He has a teacher on top of him. And you'll see his relationship with the teacher it grows in this story. And look at this. The other beautiful thing is that the monk gave him time. He did not disregard him. The monk didn't say, uh, and I'm sitting in my, I'm about to die. Leave me and myself. I'm worshipping Allah. I just want to worship Allah in peace and die like this. I don't have time for you. He didn't disregard it. So the advice is, as all the people, don't ever disregard anyone that comes to you for advice and knowledge. You don't know who Allah will use and make him the best and the biggest thing and a role model for mankind. You don't know. This monk had no clue what this boy will turn into. This boy ends up changing the world. All of those hasanat, guess whose scale they're in? In this monk's scale of good deeds. He never once rejected him and disregarded him. He looked after him like a father looks after his own son. And he taught him and gave him the knowledge according to what he is able to do. So this boy began to learn his faith. And at the same time, he's learning magic. Days go by. And this young boy starts to arrive late at the magician's place. Magician is frustrated by this. And I'm your teacher. You'll be coming late. He started to become violent towards him. And he began to beat him up. Why are you late? He hits him. And then he teaches him. And you know what? You might think, subhanAllah, he hit him. But it's actually a good thing that the magician hits him. It's actually a good thing. Because this hitting and this bad treatment of the magician is going to have a negative impact on this young boy. And it's going to turn him off from the magician altogether. How was the monk treating him? With kindness and compassion. He dealt with him like an own child of his. And this is going to make a big difference in the decision that this boy is going to make. So I bring you to a point now. The way you treat people and the manners you have with people is very important and it plays a huge role in shaping their personality and their decisions. Subhanallah. Good treatment, kind treatment. Imagine the monk was the one hitting the young boy. And the magician was the one being compassionate and kind with the young boy. What do you think the young boy would have become? Very easy. To, the results of what we're going to share would have been completely different. And so this is why the caller to Allah and the parents as well and anyone who has responsibility over young children must be very delicate and extra careful and compassionate with the young ones. More than the compassion and the delicacy a surgeon will have with his patient as he's operating on his heart. You know why? Because a caller to Allah and the parent, that we're doing surgery on the boy's faith. And the surgeon is doing surgery on a limb, on, a, on an organ, the heart. And which one's more important? Your faith is more important than your heart. What sort of benefit if your heart is in perfect condition but there's no iman in it? So the da'i, the caller to Allah must be more sensitive upon those who he's preaching to than a surgeon with his patient. Allahu Akbar. This is... Yani some beautiful advice that was given by Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimahullah, when he was addressing a group of students of knowledge. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَا كَانَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَهُ Anything that has compassion and kindness with it, it'll always be good. It'll look beautiful. And anything that has violence and roughness with it, إِلَّا uh, شَانَهُ It'll be disgusting and despicable. Subhanallah. And I tell you something, you know, the question is, is not always about how many people became Muslims because of the good treatment of Muslims. You know, you know, many, many, many became Muslims because of the good dealing of Muslims. But the real question that we're supposed to ask one another, how many left Islam 
And how many wanted to become Muslims but abandoned the entire path because of the bad manners and treatment of Muslims? That we need to be careful of and that we need to change. And we need to take inspiration from this story that even in tough and difficult and incredible times, the believer always needs to be known by his manners and good treatment of others. He needs to be known. Like this monk is existing in a very difficult time. Very difficult time. He can't even worship Allah in peace. Yet he upholds his manners as a believer. And so this is something that will save us and give us guidance and light in this time of trouble and tribulation. فَشَكَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى الرَّاهِبِ so the young boy, he complained to the monk. He said to him, Ya monk, this magician is beating me up. It's too painful. What do I do? Give me advice. See, he's going back to his teacher to take advice. He said to him, إِذَا خَشِيتَ السَّاحِرْ فَقُلْ حَبَسَنِ أَهْلِي وَإِذَا خَشِيتَ أَهْلَكْ فَقُلْ حَبَسَنِ السَّاحِرْ He gave him a solution, a way out. He says, if the magician hits you again, just tell him, look, I was held back my family. My family held me back. That's why I'm late. And if you feel that your parents are going to become rough and abusive towards you because you're coming late, tell them the magician held me back. That's lying. But this type of lying is permissible for the greater benefit. And this is a principle in Islam, right? Yeah, and imagine now I give you a scenario. Let's say someone is hiding in your house and a gunman rocks up to your house and he says, is such and such in your house? Are you allowed to lie in this situation? Of course, lie, say he's not in my house because you're going to save a life. Don't stand there and say, oh hey, Allah, he's in my house. Wallah, now I fear Allah, so I need to speak the truth. Allah, accept my taqwa and honesty from me coming. He's inside the house. And then you, you cause the destruction and the death of a life. So the idea is you need to weigh up the situation. And at times, this lying would be permissible. So this is what this old monk, wise monk, teaches this young boy. And that's what he implements for this time that he's still going to the uh, magician's house. Now, there's going to be a shift in events. One day, as he is walking to the magician's house, all of a sudden, there was a huge beast that had blocked the path of the people. People on this side can no longer get to this side, and those on this side can no longer get to that side. There's a huge beast. In uh, at tirmidhi one narration mentions there was a lion. Allahu alam, but there was a huge beast there. Very scary. No one has ever seen its size, and everyone's moving back, and no one knows what to do. So this young boy took upon himself that he's going to do something. So he approaches this beast and he says, today I'm going to find out. اليوم, I'm going to find out if the religion of the magician is better or the religion of the monk. He's going to find out today. So he took a small stone in his hand and he approached this beast and he said, Allahumma in kana amru rahi bi ahal ahabba ilayka min amri as sahir faqtul hadi hiddab. He said, Oh Allah, if the religion of the monk is more beloved to you than the religion of the magician, then kill this beast. And he threw the stone, and the beast died, and the path opened up for the people, and they walked. Allahu Akbar. But there's a lot of things to reflect. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the idea here is this. Notice his words. He said, oh Allah, if the religion of the monk is more beloved to you than the religion of the magician. Why did he say if the religion of the monk is more beloved than the religion of the magician? Why did he swap it around? He could have said if the religion of the magician is more beloved to you than the religion of the monk, then kill this beast. He swapped it. Number one. That proves that he's almost convinced about the religion of the monk. He's almost there. His fitra is taking him there. And everything he did in this event was what the monk had taught him. Who taught this boy that there's something called dua and there's something called Allahumma? And the monk had taught him Allah. The monk had taught him 
There is a relationship with Allah called a dua. The monk had taught him that Allah he is and he's the one who accepts a dua. Who taught him that Allah loves and he hates? When he said in his dua, oh Allah, if the religion of the monk is more beloved too, who taught him? That there are certain things that Allah loves and third, certain things that Allah hates. Then he said, oh Allah, kill this beast. And everyone there knows that a small stone thrown on a beast won't do anything. Yet he knows, if my dua is answered, taking into consideration this stone can't do anything, that means Allah actually caused it to die. Not the stone, Allah. And the stone was a means, and that's how I will be convinced. Allahu Akbar. A dua, my brothers and sisters in Islam, when a person is confused, is the greatest medicine out of your confusion. Now, so he made this dua. And this beast died. And that's it. He is now absolutely convinced that la ilaha illallah. Now he's on a mission. Uh, so, the idea is some people today, they say, Oh Allah, if you exist, if you exist, then show me a sign. How many times have you heard a story about people that make this dua in a moment of confusion? But the, 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 just the me fact that you said, Oh Allah, khalas, you're there, you already believe. Otherwise, who are you calling to? Who are you calling to? You're calling to someone, you don't have to see anything. The fact that Allah allowed you by your own will and choice to call on to him, that's enough of a sign. It is he subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave you the ability to call on to him. That means you know there is Allah and you know that he heard you and you're expecting a response. Khalas, amin, say la ilaha illallah. And there are miraculous signs every day all around us. You know, I once asked the sheikh about this matter. And I said to him, give me something, give me something catchy that I can use with people to convince them about this matter of miracles being seen in front of our eyes every day. But we've just come, we've become so heedless towards it. He says, he says this, he said, and I'll give you this as an example. See, this is a wooden table, yeah? If I tap this wooden table and I pulled out an orange from here and I said to you, people, this is an orange. Would you all be... Surprised and amazed, no doubt. How did an orange come out from this wooden table? Because this is something supernatural. Oh, subhanallah, we've never seen anything like this. But you know what? Apples every single day are picked from wooden tables. But it's just something they call a branch and uh, uh, a, a, a trunk and branches and leaves and then you pick the proof of fruit of it. Every single day, oranges are coming out of wood. Isn't that a miracle in and of itself? That should give you the same shock and amazement as though I just pulled out an orange from this tree or from this table. It's the idea we're seeing it every single day. So but what? We've become used to it, so we've become numb and dull and so we don't see these signs are not enough for us. Allah, give us another sign. That's your problem. Allah Azza wa has put signs all around us. So whoever wants the truth will be able to see the truth. He killed this beast and the people walked. I'll tell you something now. This young boy is going to have a huge influence and a positive influence upon his community. But do you know why the people looked up to him? Do you know why? Pay attention. Because... He, he done a social service for them. He served them. When they saw this, he became the talk of the town. You know, there was a big beast and there was a young boy and he stood in front of him and he just threw a hand. Well, Allah, this young boy, he, subhanAllah, you know, if it wasn't for the young boy, we wouldn't have been able to go to our families, the business that they would have halted. Would, you know, subhanAllah, this young boy, became a source of inspiration to his people because he served them. And so the point here, if you want to have an actual influence upon people, you need to first start by serving them. See what their problems are. Be there for them in their time of pain and calamity and grief. 
offer them advice, offer them money if you're able to help them financially. Do a social service for people. When people just rock up, right? And give a talk, or nowadays open account in social media, and ask, oh, why don't people listen to me? Okay, people don't, this is not how it works. And every single prophet served these people. Before he became a prophet, every single prophet served these people. So that's the idea, and this is what this story is teaching us. And this is why one of the great matters that you're supposed to raise the children upon, you know, there are certain matters you're supposed to raise children upon if you want them to actually be influential leaders in the future. One of these matters is to teach them to help others, to serve others. Because a great leader is someone who was raised and nurtured upon helping others and his society and his community. Subhanallah. Such a person doesn't have to speak a lot of words. If later on there is a problem in the community, all he has to say is a few words. And people respect him and look up to him because of the service he has done for them. And that's what we are learning from this boy. And this, this event of this beast dying, it's a karama that Allah gave him. You know what a karama is? What is a karama? It's a miracle that is given to other than the prophets. Why does Allah Azza wa Jal give people karamat? There are many reasons. One of the reasons to keep them steadfast upon the deen. And whoever was given a karama, a miracle, other than the prophets, that doesn't necessarily mean he's better than another believer who never received or was granted a karama in his life. That's something you need to understand. So just because this karama happened, it doesn't mean that this boy is better than the monk, for example, Yani. And so this boy becomes the talk of the town. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَأَتَ الرَّاهِبَ فَأَخْبَرَهُ This young boy is excited. He went to the monk and he informed him about what happened. He said, this is what happened. There was a beast and I killed it and I made this dua. And I'm absolutely convinced that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one Lord worthy of worship. Allahu Akbar, the monk congratulates him. Oh, mashallah, he entered into Islam. Then a rahib, this monk, listen to what he said. He said to him, Ay bunay, my dear son, anta liyawma afdalu minni. Today, you are much better than me. Allahu Akbar. The humility of the teacher with his students. And that's how he should be. You know, a successful teacher is the one who raises students that become much better than him. That's success. As for the teacher who's arrogant and making sure that no one precedes him in level and degree and knowledge, then that's an unsuccessful teacher. So look at this rahib. And, and, and just on this monk could be better than the uh, young boy, but that's his humility. And that's what we are taught as believers. You know, one of the things that we are taught as believers is that when you meet someone, you should have in your heart a belief that that person is better than me. I sit here with the belief that all of you before me are better than me. But then you say, I hope that I'm better than you in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what you hope. But as conversation and when we meet each other, that's the mentality that is supposed to be in your mind. You meet your brother with the attitude that he's better than you. If he's younger than you, that means he committed less sins than you. So he's better than you. If he's older than you, that means he's worshipped Allah a lot more than you have worshipped. So he's better than you. In every sense, you can convince yourself that he's better than you. One of the main diseases we have in the ummah today is people belittling one another, thinking that they are better than them. You see someone upon a sin, oh, subhanallah, look at these people, right? What about your own sins? What about the, the shortcomings that you have between you and Allah Azza wa Jal? So this door is endless. We can open and talk about it all day. But have this kind of knowledge and inspiration from this story. That when you meet someone, he's better than you. And you can hope that you are better than him in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. And anyone who assumes he's better than someone else, then that is the exact words and the methodology of Iblis. Isn't that what Iblis said? When he said, Ana khayrun minhu, I'm better than Adam. So anyone who actually dares to think like that, 
Huh? No matter what kind of level you're in in your knowledge and your worship, you are treading the path of Iblis. So one needs to be careful and refrain from this type of attitude and thinking and from these words. Now, and don't get this wrong. Sometimes you can advise someone of wrong they're doing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying you're better than them. But there is a common misunderstanding among people that if someone advised me about my sins, about my hijab, about my haircut, about my bead, automatically the one being advised thinks, who's this guy? He's trying to sound like he's better than me. No, that's not the case. Advice is supposed to be given. Advice comes from compassion and heart, loving hearts of believers towards one another. Because we're on this same earth, we have the same Lord, and we're supposed to be encouraging one another upon goodness. If I see you falling short in your relationship with Allah, I'll say, brother, come here. Allah Azza wa Jal forbid this. This is haram and that's how it's supposed to be done. And my attitude while saying this, I'm not thinking I'm better than you. I'm just correcting you in something that you need correction on. Now, طيب. وَإِنَّكَ سَتُبْتَلَى فَإِذَا بْتُلِيتَ فَلَا تُدُلَّ عَلَيْ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْ He said to him, today you are better than me. Look, he said to him, قَدْ بَلَغَ مِنْ أَمْرِكَ مَا بَلَغَ MashaAllah, look at the person you have become. You're a young boy. If this is what Allah has given you and you're young, what is going to happen with you when you grow older and older? That's how the monk is convincing himself that this young boy is better than him. Monk looks at himself, I'm an old man, sitting in this cave, worshipping Allah, distant myself from the community, I don't want their trouble. See, see how he's convincing himself? Yet this monk doesn't know that everything the boy that he's going to do, it's going to be all in the skills of this monk, subhanAllah. Then he said to him something important. He said to him, وَإِنَّكَ سَتُبْتَلَى He said to him, my son, you will be tested. You will be going through intense calamity and test after test. And if you are ever to be tested, فَلَا تَدُلَّ عَلَيْ Don't tell the people where I am. Keep that a secret between me and you. Don't give up my location. SubhanAllah, I want you to think of something now. This young boy, has the choice of continuing to go to the magician, set up his future forever, remember? Make as much money as he wants, demand whatever house and palace he wants. He's gonna be the right hand man of the king. He's gonna live uh, the best life. Uh, according to some people, they think this is the best life. Money, wealth, marry who you want, houses, cars, you can have what you want. You're the right hand man of the king. He could have went down that path or the other option is this path. An old man, poor, he's a fugitive of the law, he's ran away, basically he's seen as a criminal. Uh, the boy is being told, be careful, you're going to be tested. Down this path no wealth is promised, no dunya is promised. Yet what did this boy do? You know that famous thing of people say, deen over dunya? That is a practical implementation of it. And he preference and prioritized the deen over this dunya. But look what kind of dunya he had. He had it all set up. And he's young. And he can enjoy years and years of it. That's why this boy becomes a motivation. Allah Azza wa Jal changes the world on hands like this. That are never poisoned by the dunya and never distracted by its glitz and glamours and temptations and attractions. It was there. He doesn't even have to ask for it. It's already come to his doorstep. Yet he abandoned it all. And he was ready to say, La ilaha illallah. Am I going to face tests? Let it be. For Allah's sake, Allahu Akbar. When Iman hits the heart and he penetrates the heart, Nothing could be offered to you as a replacement for it. Allahu Akbar. So this boy is going to change the world now. And that's why the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, one of the seven categories that enter the shade of Allah on the day of judgment is what? What was the second one? Shabun nasha'a fi ta'atillah. A young youth 
a young boy that was, or a girl, that was raised upon the deen and nurtured upon the deen of Allah. Because it's a big sacrifice. So there's a huge reward. That you come out of your grave. Everyone is panicking. They go, Allah, go, go to the shade. Sit under the shade. Relax. Wait until everything is over. And then, well, much before that, you'll enter the paradise. What a reward. I tell you, the day, of day, the day of judgment is no joke. People coming out of their grave like locusts. Running around, everyone's terrified, naked, barefooted, uncircumcised. Where do we go? People are drowning in their sweater. Chaos! Back in one category, youth that were raised on the deen of Allah. Get lost straight to the shade. You got nothing to do with this. Straight to the shade. There with the prophets, the messengers, and relax until your time comes. Allahu Akbar. Now, reward was big because the sacrifice was big. You're going to be tested. He's been told this in the first day of his Islam. A deen is no joke. You say, La ilaha illallah, you better prepare for its path. And you know, some people have this distorted misunderstanding. They think that the day I say, La ilaha illallah, Allah now is going to love me and I should never face a test in my life ever again. Then when the test starts hitting him, he says, Brother, all I saw since I said, La ilaha illallah were tests. All I saw when I came to the masjid and started praying my first salat is sickness and problems and trials. And I, I didn't have this in my rebellious, corrupted life. Why is it all hitting me now in Islam? Shuf, Allah doesn't need you. You go back to the same way you want. Go. Like, and this is a test. Allah is cleansing you with it. He's purifying you from your rebellious and your life that you had. And this happened to everyone. Look, the day Adam السلام, ate from the tree, then he made a tawbah, right? Didn't he make a tawbah in the paradise? Allah accepted his tawbah. The first day after his tawbah, he was faced with a severe test and a huge calamity. What was that? Removed from the paradise onto earth. Is there any greater calamity than that? First day after the tawbah, Allah tests him. We have a, a, a companion, Uthman ibn Abil Aas. He said he came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he complained to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about waja yajiduhu fi jasadihi mundu aslam about an illness that he finds in his body since the day he accepted Islam. Shif how Allah tested him? The first day he said ashadu an la ilaha illallah the next day he became sick. So sick that he almost died in that sickness as another narration mentions. The idea is you'll be tested. And the same thing the monk is saying to this boy. And the magicians as well, Fir'aun. When they made their first sajda to Allah and accepted Allah, what happened? The, uh, the, the, uh, the Fir'aun threatened them all. He's going to tie them up to the trunk of palm trees. And he's going to cut their hands and their legs of opposite sides, of opposite ends. That's a calamity. That's a calamity after their first day of Tawbah. So that's what we need to understand. Anyone who comes this path will be tested. Tests will come. Allah gave this boy yet another, another karama, another miracle. And that was that his dua was now accepted. So he used to go to the akmah. Al akmah is a person that was born blind. And he would go to the abras. Al-baras is a skin disease, like leprosy. And he used to cure them by the permission of Allah. فَسَمِعَ جَلِيسُ الْمَلِكِ كَانَ قَدْ عَمِيَ فَأَتَاهُ بِهَدَاءَ كَثِيرًا So the minister of the king started to hear about this young boy, that he's curing people. And the minister of the king was blind. Akma, meaning he was born blind. All right. So this minister, you know, the ministers, what are they? they're all about dunya, they know money, they know gifts, they know bribery, that's all they know, the ministers. So he went and gathered so many gifts, so much dunya, and he went to the young boy, and he said to him, look, I've gathered and collected all these gifts for you. I'll give it to you if you can bring back my sight. So now the young boy, he says to him, Inni la ashfi ahada. I don't cure anyone. Innama yashfi Allah. Allah is the one who cures. فَإِنْ أَنْتَ أَمَنْتَ بِاللَّهِ If you believe in Allah, 
I will make dua and Allah would cure you and he will return your sight. Shuf, the priest is speaking about money. I'll give you this much gifts. The young boy didn't even comment on this. He didn't say, well, I don't want your gifts, keep them on the... He didn't even regard it because it means nothing to him. The boy commented in the aqidah part. When this minister actually believed, because they, they still think that he's going to the magician, oh, that this is his magic, he can cure the blind, please come cure my sight. He took opportunity and he taught him about Allah. He said, I don't cure. I don't cure. It's Allah, the one who cures. Believe in Allah, I'll make dua and Allah will cure you. And so, this is something that we learn. Muslim doctors should take advantage of their kuffar patients and preach Islam to them. Just like what this person, this young boy is doing. Preach Islam. Like in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he visited a Jewish boy that was about to die. After he visited him and spoke to him and comforted him, he said to him, Aslim, embrace Islam. And the young boy looked at his dad and his father said, Obey the Messenger of Allah. Ata Abul Qasim. And that young Jewish boy accepted Islam. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walks out and he says, Alhamdulillah, that Allah saved this child through me. See the ID? Yes, yani, the ID is uh, when you visit a disbeliever and it's allowed to visit a sick disbeliever, no problems. And that hadith was the proof for it. Then expose them to the religion of Islam. Fa'at al-Malik. And so now he's got his sight back. So the minister came back to the king and he sat with him, just like he always does on a normal day. So the king noticed and he said to him, Who returned your sight to you? He said, Rabbi, my lord. The king said to him, Do you have a lord besides me? He said to him, Yes, my lord and your lord is Allah. So he took him and he kept beating him, beating him, beating him until he gave up the location of the boy and the story of the boy and that the boy is the one who taught me la ilaha illallah is me. So he brought him. Allahu Akbar. But the minister's steadfastness is indeed incredible. Yani, the monk has always been worshipping Allah. We understand his steadfastness. And the boy has learned a lot about Allah and miracles are happening so we understand his steadfastness. But the minister? The, I think the champion in the story is the minister. Look at his firmness. Just yesterday, just a few hours ago, his sight came back to him. He's able now to observe the world. He can see color has meaning. He can see his family, his wife, his children. He can enjoy life with his sight. Yet he will not prefer a dunya over the deen of Allah once it has penetrated and entered his heart. Allahu Akbar. And he look at him. He's saying to the king, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. Allahu Akbar. The firmness, the steadfastness in teaching at Tawheed after having learned it just hours ago. Shuf, subhanAllah, every individual in this story is a champion. Allahu Akbar. And uh, the idea is here. Uh, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us, is teaching us through this part of the story that when a person becomes steadfast upon his deen, there are signs for this. Look at how your dunya has become in your eyes. Has the dunya become worthless and insignificant in your eyes? If it has, then that's real steadfastness. You need to see, since the day you made a tawbah and turned back to Allah, what have your priorities in life become? Have your dreams changed? Has your thinking changed? Has your personality changed? Have your decision changed? Do you see this worldly life as something insignificant compared to the afterlife? Do you see the afterlife and meeting Allah as being the greatest priority in your life or not? Because if these matters have changed in your life, then that is how steadfastness upon Iman looks like. And we learn this from the minister, from the monk, from the young boys. Look how their thinking has changed. Look how their personality has changed. Look at what their greatest concern is. 
when the boy and the minister had the world at their disposal. That's what steadfastness looks like. And so this is what we're learning from this part of the story. And of course, from the practices and the ways of Allah Azzawajal is that he tests his righteous sleeves. Because what happens now when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the young boy is brought. And the, the king says to the young boy, he says to him, my son, has your magic reached a point where you're able to give sight to the blind and cure the one who has a skin disease? He says to him, king, I don't give cure to anyone. Allah is the one who gives cure. So the king took the young boy and he began to beat him up until the young boy could no longer bear the pain and he gave up the location of the monk. So they brought the monk and they said to the monk, because he's the head of everything, now they've brought the head. They said to him, denounce your deen. And if you do not denounce your deen, we're going to saw you in half. He did not denounce his deen. So they brought a saw, a hand saw, a strong man, and they would dig the earth until they buried him to his waist. Because waist down is already split in half. Then he took the hand saw and he put it right in the middle of his head. This is a monk, an old man. It's not electrical saw, meaning the job needs a few minutes to be done. And he began through the skin, the bone, the brain, the flesh, all the way until he reached the end and he split him right in half. Allahu Akbar. And this is happening in front of the young boy and the minister as well is seeing this. There's no joke here. The king is going to do what he wants to do. Allahu Akbar. But you see, that's the idea. Anyone who wants to be steadfast and claim steadfastness of the deen will be will be uh, exposed to trial and calamity. Umar radiallahu anhu was martyred fi sabilillah. Uthman radiallahu anhu was martyred. Ali radiallahu anhu was killed and martyred fi sabilillah. And so many prophets were killed and martyred fi sabilillah and so many of their followers that happened to them as well. So it's very clear. Why does Allah test? Why does He test the righteous believers? Because number one, this is how life is. This is what Allah promised, right? This imperfect world that we live in is actually a perfect testing ground for the believers. Allah tests those who He loves. He tests the believers so He can bring out the best of worship from them. He tests them so that the worship of sabr could be perfected and it could be apparent on your limbs and on your tongue. Allah Azza wa Jal tests the believers so that the worship of tawakkul could manifest on your lips and on your tongue. So that the worship of dua becomes apparent on your tongue. So that the worship of istighatha and isti'ana, seeking only Allah's help and crying to Allah can become apparent. You tell me, how are you going to fulfill 100% sabr and tawakkul and good thought in Allah and isti'adha and isti'ana and tawakkul upon Allah if you're never tested? How are these beautiful types of worship that lead you to the paradise, how will they ever, ever manifest and become displayed on your body and your tongue if you're not tested? How? They won't. So Allah Azza wa Jal tests you, so these beautiful worships come out, and they're a reason for your paradise. And at the same time, you lose nothing. You're benefiting as well. Through this test, you're being purified and cleansed. You're being raised in elevated ranks, and you're also growing stronger in your Iman, preparing for the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why in the dua, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would say, uh, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ مُصِيبَتَنَا فِي دِينِنَا Imagine this. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, Oh Allah, don't test us in our deen. You see, you can, you can either make one of two. You'll either be tested in your faith, in your deen, like if you abandon Salat, you abandon the Qur'an, you abandon Al-Hijab, you abandon the teaching of Islam, it says it's dangerous. You're being tested in your faith. Or you could either be tested in your worldly matters, health and wealth, relationships and so on. In the dua, Nabi Wasallam would say, Oh Allah, don't make our tests in our faith. What does that mean? It means make them here in the worldly life. Don't test our faith. 
And then he would say, وَلَا تَجْعَلِ الدُّنْيَا أَكْبَرَ هَمِّنَا And don't make this worldly life our greatest concern. So much so that it becomes our priority and we forget about the afterlife and preparation for it altogether. So tests will come in this worldly life to keep you in that range where the dunya does not overtake your heart. Then they brought the minister, denounce your deen. He didn't denounce his deen, he chopped him in half as well in front of the young boy. I'll tell you something, it is from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, only upon this ummah, that if we were ever to fall in a situation like this, and it was requested from us to abandon our deen, we are allowed to utter the words of kufr by force, so long as our heart is still inclined upon iman and la ilaha illallah. It's a mercy only for this ummah. The nations of the past didn't have this. They had to be patient and go through whatever they're going through. Like in the mercy of Allah upon this ummah. This is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Allah does not hold accountable my ummah for the mistakes they do, for the forgetfulness, and for what they are forced to do. Allahu Akbar. The mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. But at times it becomes worship that you just remain patient, such as if a person was a leader and a role model for people, and that if he failed and uttered kufr, people will follow and make disbelief. In that case, a person must remain firm and be patient for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Then they brought the young boy, and the king said to him, My dear son, uh, uh, no, no, afterwards we said that, now the boy's turn. He said to the boy, denounce your deen. If you don't denounce your deen, He's not going to kill him in the same manner he did to the others because he needs to continue to the last struggle. Maybe, maybe, because this boy is the potential. So I don't want to get rid of him quickly. He said to him, denounce your deen. So he rejected. So I'm not denouncing my deen. So the king, he commanded a group of his army. He said, take this young boy and take him up to the highest mountain. And the highest mountain in town was known. Go all the way up. And give him one last chance. If he denounces, bring him back. If he doesn't denounce his deen, throw him and let him die thrown off a cliff. They took him all the way up. Imagine what, what's going through the mind of this boy. He gets up to the top and he says, Allahumma kfinihim bima shi'ta. Allahu Akbar. Once again, a dua in times of intense calamity. He says, oh Allah, deal with them in the way you want. Look at his manners with Allah. He doesn't say, oh Allah, uh, send the lightning bolt on them. Oh Allah, shake the earth from underneath him. Oh Allah, allow the earth to swallow them. No, he knows that Allah is the best of planners. I don't know. Well, I'll just make a dua. Oh Allah, deal with them the way you want. Look at his manners with Allah, his dua. And a dua in a time of intense calamity. I tell you something. Your relationship with Allah is according to how much dua you make. A person who is active in his dua, he has a good and a strong relationship with Allah. A person who abandons a dua and hardly makes dua, definitely he has a weak relationship with Allah. Why? Because the one who's making dua to Allah, he talks to Allah often. The one who abandons the dua literally is saying, I didn't have time to talk to Allah. He says what it is. A dua plays a big role in determining what relationship you have with Allah. So he made a dua in this troubling, difficult time. And Allah Azza wa Jal commanded the mountain to shake. See that? A mountain usually doesn't shake. Actually, the mountain reduces earthquakes that happens on the lands around it. But when you ask Allah, nothing is impossible. And Allah will show you miracles. So this, uh, the, the mountain shook and they all fell off the cliff and they all died. Allahu Akbar. Allah Azza wa Jal answers the call of the distressed whenever he calls him. So then this young boy decided to what? go back to the king. He could have ran away, but the boy is on a mission. A mission that is far bigger than saving his life. He's there to save the deen of Allah and to revive al-Islam wal iman in the hearts of the people. So he's not concerned about himself as much as he is concerned about his deen. Once again, that's true steadfastness. So he walks back to the king and he enters the palace. The king is shocked. He says to him, ما فعل أصحابك? He says to him, where are your friends? <laughs> and now they're the friends of the king, they're not the friends of the boy. But he got so embarrassed that he ascribed them to the boy, that where are your friends? He says to him, Allah looked after them, Allah dealt with them. 
So he commanded another group of his people. He said, take this young boy and put him in a qarqur, a boat, and go all the way until you reach the middle of the ocean. When you reach the middle of the ocean, tell him to denounce his deen. If he doesn't, he's denounce his deen, throw him. So once again, they did that. He got there, he says, Allahumma kfinihim bima shi'at. Save me from them, deal with them the way you want. And Allah Azza wa Jal destroyed those people. A big wave came, they all died and he came back. And he entered upon the king. He entered upon the king. And the king now is confused. So the young boy, he says to the king, look, you will never be able to kill me unless you listen to what I have to say to you. The only way you can kill me Take an arrow from my quiver, an arrow from my quiver. Why did he say from my quiver, not from yours? Because his, the king's quivers are as useless as his soldiers. Take one from mine, put it in the bow, roll it all the way back, and before you release it, say Bismi Rabbi Hadha al ghulam Bismillah in the name of this boy. That's the only way you'll kill me. Look, look, look at the humiliation. He's teaching the king how to use a bow and arrow. So anyway, the king wants to get rid of him. So he takes him. Uh, a day they gather, they gather the entire population, about 20,000 as Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions. They all gathered, puts them all there, gets this arrow, and, and he says, Bismi Rabbi hadha al-ghulam, and he releases it. And it enters Sadrat al-ghulam, here between the E and the head, the temple, temple area. And the boy puts his hand ala sadratihi, why was this mentioned in the narration? He did this. SubhanAllah, I can think of one similar narration among the companions. One of the companions, he had a injury in his hand. He put his hand on it and he says, Oh Allah, inna hadha qaleel wa innaka tubariku fil qaleel. He said, Oh Allah, this is little. This is little for your sake. And you put barakah in that which is little. What is he saying? He's saying, Make this small injury, injury become a big injury that it causes my death and I die for your sake. Allahu Akbar. And so the young boy is putting his hand, it's the similar situation like, this, this is little for your sake. Put barakah in this little and allow me to die as a shaheed and to come to you. Allahu Akbar. فَقَتَلَهُ And he fell and he died. He died. The day he died, the da'wah lived. Every single person in that gathering said, آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْغُلَامِ آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْغُلَامِ we believe in the Lord of this boy. Why did they believe? Because they saw in their eyes that this boy was not able to be killed except by the name of his Lord. That means there is a Lord and he's the truth. Allahu Akbar. And they all embraced Islam. The ministers quickly ran to the king and they said, O king, what you least expected has happened. The entire town is Muslim. They wanted to get rid of the monk and the minister and the young boy. You thought it's all over. The whole town has embraced Islam. You're in serious trouble. So that's when he went and became a maniac, like fill in the blanks. And what did he do? He, entire, he, he ordered the entire town to be sealed and closed off. And he dug trenches and he set up massive fires. And he said to his army and his soldiers, grab them one by one. Tell them, if they reject and denounce their deen, leave them. If they don't, throw them in that fire and let them burn. And each of the 20,000 plus or minus would not denounce his deen. And he was thrown in the fire. The narrations mention his soul was removed before his body touched the fire. Allahu Akbar. And this comes in line with hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the martyr feels the pain of death like a mosquito bite. They had died before they reached to the flame. What did they lose? You know these people? Allah says about them in Surah Al-Buruj. This is the greatest success. I ask a question. What is the greatest success? What did they do? Yeah, my, my, my brothers and sisters in Islam, they have Iman less than two, three hours max. That's all they've been believers for a few hours. What's al fawz al-kabir? What did they do? What did they achieve in life? What salat did they pray? What fasting did they do? What charity did they do? What did they do for Allah to say they have reached the greatest success? al fawz al-kabir comes once in the Quran and that's where it is. You know what the fawz al-kabir is? It is 
the fact that you remain steadfast upon la ilaha illallah until your death. That's the greatest success. Anyone who dies upon la ilaha illallah, no matter what his past is, that is indeed the greatest success. Allahu Akbar. Until finally, and this is the last part of the uh, uh, hadith, they came to a mother. And this mother was tested a lot more than everyone else. She had a newborn carried and they, uh, like, what do we do? We're going to throw you in the fire. Denounce the deen or we throw you. She buckled a little bit, was confused. So Allah Azza wa Jal gave her and aided her with a miracle. Allahu Akbar. You know, when Allah says, Inna ma'al usri yusra, that's a clear manifestation of it. That young boy, newborn, who usually doesn't talk, spoke. And he's one of four newborns that would speak at the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would tell us. But this boy would say, Isbiri ya umma fa innaki ala al-haq. Be patient, O mother, for indeed you are upon the truth. How beautiful is this? That Allah Azza wa Jal soothes and comforts the believer in a time of intense calamity. And so when he, she heard this, they took her and her baby and threw them both in the fire. Allahu Akbar. But you see this isbiri fa innaka ala al-haq. This is advice we give one another. Brothers and sisters in Islam, be patient. Be patient upon the deen of Allah. Be patient upon the obligations of Allah. Why? Why? Because it is the truth. Be patient upon the hijab because it's the truth. Be patient upon your prayers because it's the truth. Be patient upon la ilaha illallah because it's the truth and there's nothing more true than that. Fa'isbir. فَإِنَّكَ عَلَى الْحَقِّ upon patience. You're upon the truth and that's what allows the believers to enter the paradise. Finally, my brothers and sisters in Islam, I conclude with this point, just so that we can clear something here. In the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned how he has cursed the people of Al-Ukhdud, the king and those people that had committed this atrocity and this genocide of their own people. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, and you know, when something like this happens, What's the first thing people doubt about Allah? When a genocide happens, like the one that happened in this story, the first thing that people start doubting is about Allah. Where is He? Where is Allah? Can't Allah see all this? Why doesn't Allah do anything? I'll tell you something. Watch this. Something unique. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, in Surah Al-Buruj, He says, Wallahu ala kulli shay'in shaheed. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَهُمْ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said, فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيد Right? He says, and Allah is upon everything a witness. He's been a witness to everything all along. This is the point. Every single calamity that happens in your life, in one way or another, Doubt will creep into your mind concerning one particular name of Allah. The stories of the Quran, the stories of the Quran, if you notice, if you notice, the name of Allah that is mentioned within the calamity is the name that people will doubt the most about Allah. And you see this story, Al Buruj, when you hear of it, 20,000 being genocided and killed, where's Allah? In the same surah, Allah said, Allah ala kulli shayin shaheed. He saw it all. Don't you dare doubt that Allah Azza wa Jal is a witness to all of this. Don't you dare doubt. And every single calamity in the Quran, read it, go tonight, and this is your homework. Every calamity of a prophet, observe the name of Allah that is mentioned. You will find that that is the name of Allah that people will doubt the most when they face that same calamity. Ayyub alayhi salam, 18 years of sickness. What's the name that you'll doubt of Allah the most? That He's the most merciful. Yet He will say, Wa anta arhamur rahimeen. You say, do that as, as a project for yourself and see how true it is, subhanAllah. So the idea is inspirational story. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He guide us through this story. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive us and to grant us all acceptance. Jazakum Allahu khairan for your attentive listening and your patience. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een.